Hello and thanks for joining us today on Encore. He grew up in Chicago in one of the most dangerous housing projects in America. At five, he discovered he had a talent for drawing and gang leaders would offer him protection in exchange for appearing in his comic books. Now, four decades on, he's a revered New York artist. His work has been shown all over the world, from London to LA and Turin. He's here for his first solo show in Paris, Nathaniel Mary Quinn. Hello. Hello. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for being here. Now your works are beautiful, seductive, unsettling, <laughs> and um, distinctly poignant. Uh, what's it like bringing them to, the, to an art capital like Paris? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, very excited about that. It's, it's, it's a thrill. It's fascinating, you know, because Paris is such a beautiful city. It's a great place. Um, Gagosian Paris is a, a, a phenomenal venue for the works to be exhibited in, and I'm looking forward to the opening, and hopefully the, the show will be well received by the public. So I'm very excited. Okay, well, let's take a look um, at some of your work. Now, the show is called The Forging Years. Yes. It's on at the Gagosian Gallery in Paris. And why that title? The show, it serves to visually paint a picture of a narrative that was fed to me to describe the circumstances surrounding the death of my mother. During this part of my life, this narrative and those years played a pivotal role in forging my identity and the lens through which I learned to see the world. So that's why the show is called The Forging Years. Well, people don't need to know your story um, to appreciate your art, but it does add, add to the interest of it. You grew up as the youngest of five boys in a housing project in Chicago. Um, how did you discover you could draw? Um, well, one day as a child, before I could walk, I was drawing on the walls of the um, uh, apartment in which we live. And of course, my mother was going to spank me for doing such a thing. But my oldest brother, he stopped her. He says, hey, mom, take a look. Look at his drawing. It's actually pretty good. My mother was also suddenly surprised, and I think they both came to the conclusion that perhaps I had a talent. From there, uh, from that point, my mother began to encourage me to draw on the walls in an effort to um, advocate for the further discovery of this talent that they thought I had. Well, you went on um, to get a scholarship to a private boarding school. Um, and so you got away from sort of the poverty and, and the danger of the projects, but it was still a traumatic time for you because during that time at the school, you lost your mum. Yeah. Um, and when you came home for Thanksgiving, uh, you found that your father and your brothers had gone. That's right. And you're only 15. That's correct. Um, what did you do? Um, well, at that moment, I knew I could not stay in the uh, apartment because I came home. Of course, my, my four older brothers and my dad were not there. I asked my next door neighbor for information of which she had none. So I, uh, in Chicago, you know, in New York, you have brownstones. In Chicago, you have graystones. And uh, in the graystones, there is a door that, that is normally open, after which there is a foyer area, quite small. I spent the night there. Because the apartment, I had surmised, had already become... A, uh, a place of drug transactions. It would have been quite dangerous for me to stay there. And then the following morning, I called my friend at the time, um, and I told him about my circumstances, and his mother came to the rescue, and, um, 
and then the rest of the story goes from there. So I, had, I, I was able to, able to gain some kind of refuge in that transitional period. You went back to school, you clung to education, you graduated with honours, um, and at that time you added your mum's name, Mary, to your own. That's right. Um, why was that important? Because my mother never had a formal education. My parents were both illiterate. They could not read or write. And um, that, that stayed with me. Education has always been very important to me. When I was graduating from high school, from um, uh, Culver Academies, um, I decided at that moment to use my mother's first name as my middle name. And Nathaniel Mary Quinn will now be on the degree. Uh, so it would be as though my mother, too, has attained these degrees from these different institutions. Recently, I was conferred with an honorary doctorate from my college, Wabash College, and on it, it says Nathaniel Mary Quinn. So now my mother, too, has an honorary doctorate. When you um, had sort of finished your education, you moved to Brooklyn, which is where you still are now, mm -hmm. um, and you made art. You were working as well as a professor, a tutor. You mentored as well um, vulnerable young people mm -hmm. um, in the community. Uh, those early work works, though, they're quite different to what we're seeing today. Um, you focused on the politics of race in America. Mm -hmm. uh, did you feel you had a certain sort of pressure as an artist of color in America? Well, you know, I think that that was a part of me that felt, um, oh, maybe a certain sense of responsibility to make works of that subject matter, to explore those ideas. But during that same time in my life, I was still dealing with the sense of, of um, separation and abandonment by my family. I was, um, I was devastated, you know, emotionally speaking. And I went to therapy for five years. And throughout therapy, that's when I began to embrace something a bit more complex about my humanity. You know, I come to find out that the color of your skin cannot protect you from the pain and anguish that would most certainly come upon you if you happen to be abandoned by your family at a young age. And it was then, sort of a decade ago in 2013, um, that your work became more personal. Um, it became based on the people you'd known. In one article I saw um, the work that we see now described as a combination of collage, Francis Bacon and scrambled identikit police sketches. Um, <laughs> they look like collages, but everything is actually drawn or painted. Yes, um, that's right, that's right. So how, how did your work become, become like this then? I was touring this, this kid and his mom was an art lover. You know, I saw that she was an art collector and she offered to do a show for me in her place. I say yes to it. And she wanted to support me, which is very beautiful. And that, anyhow, I had like four works and I wanted to make a fifth work, but I only have five hours to make this fifth work. So I decided to find ways to only focus on that which was necessary for the work. So the focus on the eyes, the nose, the lips, that's it. Just things like that. And um, so through a process of using construction paper and hiding what I had already rendered, when I removed the construction paper, what was revealed was this, you know, really brand new approach to making my work, which is how I came to the style that I work with now. Well, I want to talk about one of the new, newer works, which is in um, the Paris exhibition. And um, tell me about Intruder. Ah, oh, Intruder is just uh, an amalgamation of visions of the potential young men who may have been my friend or somebody I knew who um, played a role in entering the home of my uh, apartment in pursuit of regaining payment for drugs that were sold on credit. So lots of your work are people who come from that period of time in your past. My work is um, primarily fueled by vulnerability and empathy, you know, and I have a keen ability of detecting people's um, inner selves, the very inner selves that people oftentimes try to hide from the world. I have a real sense of 
being able to detect that into in, in people. Um, and you have broken out to a, ma a mass um, audience. Do you think that's why people can connect so so well with it? Because there's a certain truth in the work. Yeah, I think that um, people are not as seamless of a formed identity as they would like to believe. But most people don't have it all together. They just don't. That's a falsehood. I think there is great beauty in embracing the um, everything about who you are. The, the fragments. All the fragments of who you are. Everything. Um, because you have to live with those fragments in your life. It's your life. You cannot change the history that you endured. It's impossible. Okay. Nathaniel, Mary Quinn, thank you so much for coming in and talking to us about your history and everything you that you've much. enjoyed. It's been a pleasure. Our exhibition, The Forging Years, is on at the Gagosian Gallery in Paris until the end of July. Now, we always end our show with our guests' cultural pick of the moment. What have you chosen for us? Um, the, the TV epic side series, Love and Death. It's a great show. It's on HBO Max. I think everybody should make some time to watch it. It's fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much. We will. We're going to leave you with that. Thanks for watching. See you next time. You just chopped and chopped and chopped. I didn't do it. I think you did. You're wrong. This is Texas. Folks might be able to forgive murder. Adultery, not so much. The jury needs to see you as human. And the truth has a way of coming out. Versailles, Mont Saint Michel, the Louvre are well known stars of French heritage. But French genius and France harbors many other hidden treasures. The arts, gastronomy, architecture, as well as nature's wonders. Come along with France 24, discover France's living heritage. From young apprentices to accomplished craftsmen and farmers, to Michelin star sporting chefs, meet these people whose passion for their professions preserve and drive French heritage. You are here on France 24 and France24.com.